OK, so what I want to talk about in this section is I want to talk a little bit about the software. I want to talk about how you can navigate through it, save files, load files, uh, save images, load images. Um, and then I also want to talk about just the principles of getting that image. You know, okay, what, what goes into doing a good image? What are the different terminologies there? So we make sure that we're talking about the same thing. So what is Inside Explore? It is the all-powerful. No, just um, Inside Explore is the software application that you can use to set up Insight. So this can either be spreadsheets or Easy Builder. Both are contained within Inside Explore. It can go either way. So when we set it up, it is a .NET application. That means people can actually change where these things are all over the place. And I've seen them get these things stuck in some really bad situations. But normally how we set it up, is that when you open up the program, if you open up the network file, it should be all the way over to the left for you. So any of your PCs or your cameras that have already been resolved, have IP addresses and everything, should be noted in that file. Uh, or I should say noted in that pane. If you double click on any of them, it'll allow for you to connect to it. And you can toggle it on or off with a little icon or underneath View Insight Network Pane. Then we have the Insight Spreadsheet. This is where all the power is. This is kind of, you know, the cauldron sitting there. It's got your spreadsheet that sits over your image. Now you might say, oh, I don't like it this way. Now by the end of this class and everything, we're going to create custom views. So we're going to basically get the spreadsheet out of there anyway and just show you what we want to show you. But it is, this is really your connection to Insight. Everything else around there is just wrap around it. This center pane, that is your connection to the Insight. That's where you're programming right onto the Insight system itself. Um, I'm going to show you how to remove the overlay and whatnot so that you can see the image and then put the overlay back on so that you can um, see your programming. The transparency of the overlay is really up to you. You can either have it more transparent or less transparent. It does not change the program. It is really a personal preference for your PC. Then we have the Insight Files pane. So that's going to go between the network pane and the actual spreadsheet pane. So your file pane is going to show you what files are sitting on that unit. So let's say that tonight, you know, we've gone through, we're going to hit about four or five tools today. You guys are going to get through that, be so tired by the end of the night, you're going to be like, okay, we'll just take this up tomorrow. I'm getting out of here. I just need to go have a cold beer and just let it all sink in. So now tomorrow, we have a big thunderstorm tonight shuts off power to the room and everything. You come back in tomorrow morning, and your job's gone. You lost power during the night, never saved it, ah, gone. Okay. So what do you think is going to happen when you say, hey, Bonnie, my job's gone. What do I do next? What do you think I'm going to say? I'm going to say, yep, you got a few minutes before class. Let's see how, <laughs> let's see how well you got it. And you're going to curse me. And then you're going to say, but wait a minute. I know he's got the program itself set up correctly. I think I'll just take Patrick's program. So what you can do is if you single click on the network thing, okay, single click on the network, it will show you the files in the file pan for that camera. Don't double click on it. You double click, you're logging onto that camera. You don't want to do that. But if you single click, you can see the files for that camera. And so now you can just drag and drop over for yours. Now at this point, Please do a save as. If you don't do a save as, what's going to happen if you hit save? You're going to overwrite Patrick's program. He's not going to be a happy camper because here he is trying to help you. And now all of a sudden, you've just destroyed his program as well. So please make sure that you make sure you save it to your camera. Then you can change it whatever you want. You just need to adjust for your, your particular uh, field of view. Now we have the one all the way over to the right, and that's the Insight pane. Is that what they call it? Yeah, the Insight palette. And it really has. Three, I first section is tools, where all, all our tools lie. So you can open them up, drag and drop those tools onto your spreadsheet. The second tab is your snippets. We're going to find out a little bit more about snippets today. They're basically sample code. They're a way so you don't have to recreate the wheel every single time you want to do something. And then we also have test run. Um, it's just a way to maintain your program and make sure that if you adjust things that it doesn't break the program in the long run. Now we have some shortcut buttons. Now all the shortcut buttons are found on one of the pull-down lists. Okay, not everything on the pull-down list are on the buttons, but you know here's just this large array of shortcut buttons. 
because we want you to be, use whichever one's comfortable for you. Some people are more comfortable with pull down list, other people are more comfortable with shortcut buttons, whatever works for you. That's the same thing, we're just trying to make it easy for you. And we also try to make it very intuitive. We want to make it Microsoft-like, okay? So new job looks like a new piece of paper. Opening looks like a folder opening. Now a few years ago someone had said, but what are you going to do about that icon for saving? What do you mean? What is it? Yes, for you youngsters, that's a floppy disk. Not used anymore, but that was a floppy disk. <laughs> so we try to make it very Microsoft-like with the icons. Also, when we're doing the record and playback of the image and everything, you'll notice that it looks very MP3-like. So you can play it, you can go to the next one, go to the very last one, go to the very first one, you know, go to the previous one. So that's just kind of the basic setup of it, so that you can become kind of comfortable that you can turn off or on any of those panes that you want, whatever works for you. So now let's actually talk about the image itself. So that's really what we want to do first, is we want to get a good image to come into it. So what we have to think about is what's actually happening. So I have a, whether it be a CCD, a charge couple device, or a CMOS device, I have an imager. Okay, the imager is going to be divided up into however many picture elements that you have for your resolution. Okay, uh, each of those are little wells that as light hits it, they start charging. If you get too much light in the well, what it does is it spills over to the well next to it. This is called blooming effect or overexposure. Now what happens if that well is right on the side of an edge, a light to dark transition? What's going to happen to that edge if I get too much light in those picture elements or pixels? You're going to get fuzzy. It's going to be blooming. You might, it might end up actually looking like it's moved the edge a little bit. But either way, it's going to make it look kind of blurry. So one of the things we have to keep in mind is that almost all the vision tools we're going to be talking about today, what they're dealing with is light to dark transition or dark to light. They're really talking about co contrast. Whether I'm talking blob, histogram, edge tool, pattern finding tool, does not matter. All that it's looking at is where my light to dark or dark to light transitions are. That's really what it's dealing with. So I want to make sure I get a picture that doesn't start moving where those are. Not too much light into it, but enough that I have good contrast, that I can see that light to dark transition. Now each of those pixels are also going to have a location, where they are within the grid of pixels, as well as a value. Now since we're using a monochrome camera, our value is going to be something from 0 to 255. Mmm, 255, I love that number. What's so special about 255? It's 8-bit, exactly, it's 8-bit. So very often you might hear different cameras that are like 12-bit or 16-bit or, or something like that. We're dealing with an 8-bit grayscale camera. It means from black being 0 to white being 255, it's going to be divided up into 256 levels. All different, very, so it's not just 50 shades of gray. We're talking 256 shades of gray. We also have color, too. And I'm going to go into color a little bit more when we hit the advanced class, but let me just quickly say that we usually use a bare filter with the color cameras. So what we're doing is we're approximating what that value is. And it can either be represented in RGB, which is red, green, blue, or it can also be represented in HSI, which is hue, saturation, and intensity. Like I said, I don't want to go too much into this right now because I'm going to cover it all again when we hit the, the color section. Let's hold that excitement until that time. Now we have not created a psychic camera yet. So the field of view is whatever's in the field of view is what we're inspecting. If your part's not in the field of view, guess what? It's not getting inspected. Now you might say, well that's a duh moment. I cannot tell you how many people still don't quite get that. We do have one tool that comes close to being psychic, and that's our PatMax tool. But otherwise, all the tools have to have what it's looking for inside the field of view. In fact, it needs to be inside their region of interest. But the biggest region of interest you can have is the field of view. So it's got to be in there. If it's not in there, we're not looking at it. Now a couple of the other things that go into this is also how high your item is from your, your camera. Okay, so that's the working distance. You also need to know what the CCD size is as well as what the lens side is. Now on our website we have a lens calculator that can help you with this. Now you don't need to remember what the CCD size is. So the calculator already has that set up. It says, well what camera are you using? Oh, I'm using a 7400. Okay, knows what the CCD size is. And then it's going to say, well, what are you looking for? Are you looking for a lens, a working distance, or a field of view? 
you might know what your working distance should be and what your, your part should be. So you say, no, just give me a lens. So you put in what your working distance is, you put in what your field of view is, and it will give you back what the lens is. Or you could say, no, nope, I have a lens. I know how big my part is. Just tell me how high I need to be from it. And it'll tell you. You've got three components in there. You've got to give it two, and it will give you the third one. Our um, website, uh, cognix.com, we have something in the training. I think it's called Useful Tools. Lighting. Lighting can make an easy application tough. It can make a tough application very easy. If this is your first application, I highly recommend that you work with, a with your local distributor or your local sales engineer. On looking at your lighting, you might have a light that works perfect, and it might. It might be perfect. But they've already had enough lighting experience that they could say, yeah, that works for you now, but what about when that other part starts coming in? Maybe it has a more bluish tint. That's not going to work for you. Or what about when you start trying to look for the holes in there? You're going to get too much shading or something. They might have some ideas that help you with it because they're trying to help you not only immediately, but a little bit down the road, too, to try to help you with it. Now we have the actual spreadsheets coordinate system. You'll notice that it doesn't look normal, does it? That's because the rest of the world, when I say a 640 by 480 image, we think 640 across, 480 down. But that's not true vision coordinate systems. In true vision coordinate system, it's x down, y across. We have it sitting on top of a spreadsheet. What is going to be labeled in the vertical column? Rows, yes. Rows are going to be labeled in the vertical column. And what's going to be labeled in the horizontal axis? Columns. So instead of messing you up by saying X and Y, we're going to mess you up by saying rows and columns. It's kind of like an Excel spreadsheet. Now let me make sure I say it is not Excel. It's Excel-like. It is the VBA implementation of Excel. So we're going to label it rows and columns. Now when you get to calibration, you can put it in any orientation that you want. You can go back to Cartesian coordinate systems where X is to the left and Y is going up whatever works for you. But for pixel coordinate system, it's going to be rows and columns. So how do we capture an image? We look at the camera and say, go capture it. And then when that doesn't work, then what we need to do is we need to trigger the camera. Now, up on our, our buttons that we have up there, we have a manual acquisition. That's going to be a one-shot acqu acquisition. So it's much like your digital camera hitting that click, bam, takes that image. Otherwise, on that other button, we have live mode. And the live mode really does a pseudo acquisition, so it just keeps acquiring, acquiring, acquiring. But this is where you can set it up to adjust your lighting. If you're using a C-mount lens, you can adjust your aperture and your focal length. So beautiful. You can also get access to this if you go in and need image. It should say trigger and live image, and you would just choose one. With spreadsheet, you can go into this as long as you're offline. You can go into live mode whenever you want. In easy builder, some of you might have gotten bitten by live mode where you could only go into it if you're in the setup image setting. Now, when you have your spreadsheet, you will notice that there is one cell that is there. Okay, It is A0. It is the special all-controlling cell. It cannot be deleted. It cannot be copied. It cannot be moved. It will always be there. Think of it as kind of a conduit between the hardware and the software. This is how your image is getting up from your camera over to the software so you can analyze it. So A0 is sitting there. If I double click on it, it's going to open up into a little parameter box. And that parameter box is going to allow for me to choose some options in there. One of the options is your trigger. Okay, the very first thing is, how do I trigger when I'm online? So when I turn the system online, how is it expecting to trigger? So right now, the first option it gives is camera. So remember I said all the units had this input, optically isolated input? for your tr um, camera trigger, that's what camera trigger is. I have current go through there, it's going to cause it to acquire. So it's great for a proc switch being there. Boom, boom, boom. Beautiful. Then I can also turn it to continuous. Continuous is just going to constantly acquire. Bam, 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 bam. Now the next one is external. External is going to allow for you to use some type of external trigger to, to acquire it. But, but wasn't that what camera is? Huh, what's the difference between them? Other than how they're spelled, no, there is actually a slight difference between them. Camera trigger is considered a hardware trigger. What that means is when you go online, whatever the settings are for the acquisition, it's already primed up and ready to go. So as soon as the trigger comes in, never looks back at software again. Automatically, 
pulls the image and comes back up again, grabs the new set of settings, and it's ready and primed again. Because of it being primed, it means it can react to the trigger like less than a microsecond. It's reacting to the trigger pulse coming in. So very quick. So it's really good for very high speed applications that you need almost immediate response to that trigger. Now external trigger, what it does is when the, the sees the trigger, it says, oh, let me go grab the settings of the acquisition and let me go take the acquisition. Because it's got to go through the software first, it responds in more like a millisecond. So we can see that they slightly change depending on when they see the signal. Now there's one other difference between them. If I am changing one of the settings on the fly, let's say I'm changing exposure setting, a setting inside the acquisition that's very often changed, especially when you have parts that kind of have lighting issues, a lot of reflections, sometimes you change the exposure just to see which one's going to give you a better image. Now if I'm using a camera trigger and I change the exposure, what happens is I have to have two triggers before it takes the change. Because the first one still has the old one, it acquires with it, and then it grabs the new one, and now it'll grab it. Well, if I use external, because it's looking at the software right at the time that it's grabbing it, it sees the new settings and it grabs it. So you kind of have to think to yourself, do I need speed, or do I need some type of variability? If I need some variability, I might want to think about external. If I need speed, then I need to stay with camera, knowing that I, if I change something, I've got to trigger twice before it's ready. Then we also have manual. Manual means it's going to be a software calls it. SE8 could be little, just the manual acquisition hitting F5 on your, your keyboard, whatever. And then finally, network, we have master-slave acquisition. Now there's a whole bunch of parameters in acquire image, a whole bunch of them. I'm not going to cover them all, but let me just cover a couple of them. One, exposure. We have an electronically shuttered camera. Remember I said there was three things that went into the cycle time. The acquisition time, the time that it takes to get the image off the CCD or the imager. The processing time, the time that it takes for the processor to go through all the tools. And exposure. So the exposure, this can get set down to like microseconds. And it can also go up to a second if you want. So it's just a matter of how long does the shutter stay open, letting light in, so that I can get a good image. We are also a progressively scanned camera. So we actually can say what row to start at and how many rows to go. This can give you advantage, two advantages. What are the advantages? And don't just say speed because they both have to do with speed. It's changing the field of view. It's faster acquisition time. If I have a smaller area that I'm acquiring, it's going to be quicker to acquire it. And then yes, if I have a smaller area to look in, there's less regions that my, my tools have to look for. If there's less pixels it's got to process, it's going to go faster. It can also do this thing that's um, called masking. Like, let's say I'm trying to read 1D barcode. And let's say my next part might be at either at the top or the bottom of the screen. I don't want to read those 1Ds. I just want to read the ones in the center. If I only acquire the ones in the center, then who cares what's sitting at the top and the bottom? I can never have a misread there because I'm only looking at those sitting right in the center. The rest, if you want to turn the light on for the camera, you have this light control right here. So the light can be turned on. Uh, you can have it to be exposure controlled or always on. Always on keeps it on at 50% until you acquire, then it's 100% and then back to 50. Exposure control only <laughs> turns it on when you acquire, and then it turns it back off again. What we're going to be using is we're going to be using it in continuous mode. Now saving jobs. You can save jobs to the camera, to another camera, to some place on your hard drive. Now what's the difference between save and save as? Save as will allow for you to choose where to save it to. Save will save it to wherever you had opened it from. So the reason I say that is because when you first do a save and you've never saved the job, it's going to ask you where to put it. But save will always save to where you opened it from. Now when you open jobs, you can open them from your camera, from another person's camera, from any place on your hard drive. You just choose which, what it is and open it up. Now saving images. We cannot save images to cameras. Okay, There's a caveat for that. I don't want to discuss the caveat yet. So we're, not, we're saying that you can't save images to cameras. You can only save them to your emulator or to someplace on your hard drive. Now images can be saved as a bitmap or a JPEG. Now how many people think that they would save theirs as a bitmap? How many people think they'd save it as a JPEG? How many people don't think that they would ever save images at all? So what's the difference between them? If you're doing a tech support call, they're going to ask you to send them an image. They're going to want a bitmap. A bitmap is a bit by pixel by pixel exact representation of that image. So whatever happened on your system at that time with that image, if they take your job and they take that bitmap and they put it in their emulator, they're going to see the exact same thing. 
especially if you're doing anything with tools. Why is this tool doing this versus that? We need to know exactly what the pixels are doing, especially edge tools and stuff. We've got to know exactly where they're lining up. While if for some reason some government organization has told you that you have to save images like three times every hour, you know, for the life of your product, then you might want to do JPEG. Okay, because in that case, yeah, you could see it again, but some of the image is lost during the compression. So it's not going to be exactly what you had acquired it as, but it's going to be much smaller. You might as well save them all on some server someplace to, to appease some type of organization. So yes, yeah, so if you're ever doing your own diagnostics, if you're ever doing troubleshooting, or you're ever trying to test the system, you really should be using bitmap. Recording images. So you can go in there and record images. So after I go through all this this week, you guys are going to be like, OK, I'm dangerous now. Let me go see if I can fix the application. But you might need some images first. So you might want to go out on your line, and you might want to record some images first. So that you have some images, sit down on your emulator, try it all out before you actually stop the line and put your program on it. So when you go to, to start recording, we have this little folder that has the record and a playback button in it. That's our options folder. So what's going to open up is a little utility box that's going to give you two tabs. One's going to be record, one's going to be playback. Now in the record, it's going to tell you where you're going to record it to. So you can hit the little three dots at the end, record it any place on your hard drive, any place on the server, any place that you have access to from that PC. Um, if there's already images there, it's going to tell you what the image count is. If it doesn't, and you don't see any images. What do you want the name to be? Right now it's just image. How do you want it formatted? It can be either date or index stamp. And then do you want JPEGs, uh, JPEGs or bitmap? Well, if you're going to test your program, you probably want bitmap. So you want to save bitmaps into it. And then how many do you want to save? When it hits that limit, it's going to put up a little Windows messaging box saying limit has been reached, and it will stop recording. Image resolution, full. Now, why someone would want something other than full resolution, I still don't know. Obviously, someone did, so we give you that option. But usually, if you're really testing the system, you want the full image. You want as the camera acquired it. Now, watch cell. This allows for you to decide whether the image is good or, or bad or not. If I say, do not use a watch cell, every single time I acquire, it's going to record that image. It doesn't matter whether I'm online or offline. Now, if I reference a cell that has a non-zero value, it's going to consider that good. If I reference a cell that has zero or pound air, it's going to consider it bad. Or I can say sort on whether it's good or bad. Okay, So do I just want to record good ones? Do I just want to record bad ones? Do I want both recorded but divided into their folders? So in that case, I would need to reference someplace on my spreadsheet that has some type of logic letting me know whether it was good or bad. So when we go to record, we need to make sure our options are set up correctly, point to the correct directory that we want to use, and then it's just a matter of pushing the record button. So now every time you acquire, once again, whether you're online or not, you could just be hitting F5 from there just checking things out, it will record to that folder. Now we can also do playback, and we're going to use playback extensively inside the advanced class. So the uh, playback is point to a folder that has the images, and it's going to tell me how many images is inside that folder. So I kind of get warm, fuzzy feelings that I've chosen the right place. Then my playback mode, it can either be continuous or single pass. What do you think an advantage of using single pass would be? It's not going to cycle through, and how could this be an advantage to you? I know how many good and bad images I have in there. So if I go through this once, I should get that many good and bad images in there. Instead of it keep going around and around, you're not sure if you're counting that same image over and over. You're just kind of going through it once and saying, I know I have five good, four bad. Do I get five good and four bad at the end of it? And also your time delay. This is how long it takes between the images if you're in a play mode. Right now, it's set to half a second. Trust me, that is long enough. I've seen people say, oh, no, no, I need three seconds. So they turn it to three seconds, and I'm looking over there, and they're like, because it takes so long, really. Half a se you think 0.5 seconds, it actually is quite a bit of time. So if I want to play back, i got to go in, choose my options, make sure I'm choosing the folder that I want. And then it's just a matter of playing it. I can either keep it in a play loop, or I could jump to the next one, jump to the very last one, jump to the first one, jump to the previous one. Now spreadsheets. How many of you guys are Excel masters? For Excel, I said that this is very Excel-like, but remember it's not Excel. There's really two concepts you need to know about Excel to be able to get a good grip of what's going on here. The first concept is labeling, the actual cell itself. 
So we're going to label it column and then row. Second thing is, wait for it, referencing. The idea of absolute and relative referencing. Now this really only comes into play when you are copying and pasting. Let me say that one more time. Relative and absolute referencing really only comes into play if you copy and paste. Okay? If I'm cutting, if I'm inserting, doesn't matter. Insight takes care of all that. They move everything accordingly. But only when I'm copying and pasting something will it matter whether it's relative or absolute. So how it works is if you have a dollar sign in front of the column and or row, it means when you copy that value to another value, it stays exactly what that is. If I, if I have sitting at A5, the absolute reference of A3 plus the absolute reference of A4, and then I copy it to B5, I'm still looking at A3 and A4. They haven't changed. They have not moved. Now, if I do relative referencing, so I don't have the dollar signs in front of it, if I have this sitting at A5 and then I copy it to B5, because I relatively move from A to B, all my columns will adjust accordingly. So now I'm looking at B3 and B4. Just putting a dollar sign in front of it nails down that either row and or column, whichever one you put it in front of. So it can also be a hybrid of them too. If I try to go in there and I can start building my formula, once again this is very Excel-like in the sense that it gives you a color. So as you see in your formula editor, like you see right now, it's saying A2 and it's in blue. And it shows you the little square around A2 in blue. So now I can visually real quickly say, yeah, am I pulling the right numbers? And then I say plus, and then A is it 3 is the next one. Yep, A3. So I now see orange and a little orange box around it so I can see what's going on there. Um, and choosing relative and absolute is going to be up in my shortcuts, whether it looks like a grid with a dollar sign there or just a grid. To accept or to reject things. To accept it's a little checkbox. To reject it is a little X box. Enter usually means accept. And escape usually means reject as well. It's not 100% of the time, but most of the time. That's the same thing. So when I go to go enter a formula, I want to go into an empty cell. And then I need to choose whether I want to do absolute or relative. Choose that mode that I want to go into. And then it's going to go into the cell finding mode. So I'm going to see my image go away. My spreadsheet's going to look you know, very apparent to me. And in this case, it's probably going to show me a little blue box someplace. So I need to go choose the cell that I want to choose and then say OK. So then that's going to be my formula uh, list. I'm going to go up, say plus, choose my next number, so forth and so on. And it builds a formula. Now I'm going to show you how to do this. I'm not going to make you guys do it. And I do know it looks painful. Don't freak yet. OK? We want to crawl before we walk, walk before we run. I got to say, doing it this way does sound painful for it. It's going to be so much easier as we get going with it, that we actually have real values. Now we also have a way of viewing dependencies, because some people actually don't comment their program. So sometimes we have to go see how things are related to each other. So we can actually say view and dependency so we can see how a cell relates to the other one. If there's any solid blue arrow coming into the cell, it means those other cells have a dependency on the one you're looking at. If I have any green solid arrows going out of it, it means that those other cells are dependent upon the one you've chosen. Dashed arrows mean that cell state, I don't even want to go down that road yet, um, but it just means some other cell is controlling the cell state of that cell. So you can turn them on and off levels, depending on how many levels you want to see. I can increase levels, I can decrease levels, I can erase all the lines because I'm sick of looking at them. I can only show pound errors, but we don't know anything about pound errors yet, but I can look for where my errors are coming up. And then I can also see little pink boxes, meaning the buck stops here. It means these cells are not being used anyplace else in the program. So if you're try, trying to scramble for some extra space or, or try to clean things up, you can always get rid of any cells that are surrounded by pink. We have our help. You go to the Insight Help. The help will allow for you to take a look at what's going on with all the tools. One of the things I love about the help is if you look underneath spreadsheet functions, so if you go spreadsheet function reference and you take a look here, this list right here actually matches the list in the function palette. So if you're a visual person, it'll show you where that is. Otherwise, also if you choose a particular health topic, which they removed that particular slide from it, if you choose a health topic, 
it will also tell you where it was found. Like if I was looking at extract blobs, it tells me vision tool blobs. So I know that that function is found underneath the vision tools blob area. So we've talked about Insight Explorer, how it can actually manage multiple networked insights from a single PC. We have the spreadsheet. All the cells that go into the spreadsheet compose the job, and it's saved as a .job file. Searchable help is available through the help menu in Insight Explorer. And we've also had the context sensitive help if you hit F1. So if you're in the middle of your blob tool, you can't remember what the inputs all went for, that you could hit L F1. It will come up on the help file in the blob tool, and you can quickly look to see what's going on. So let's try this out. There's really two parts to this lab. One part I'm just going to show you. The second part actually has to do with getting an image. So let's go ahead and get an image first. So right now, I'm logged on to my unit. So I can see up in the upper left-hand corner up here, I can see that I'm logged on to Bonnie. It's a 7402. And so now I want to get an image. So let me go ahead. Here's my either just trigger the camera, which takes whatever's underneath it, or I can say live video. So if I go into live video, you can see, yep, something's kind of there. So let me take my good part. The good part says ABC123, and I'm going to put that underneath my camera. Okay. Now, if I had aperture setting, I would probably give it a little bit more aperture and everything. Unfortunately, it's not the greatest. It's, you guys can't actually see this, so I'm going to actually affect it other ways. But let me also just do an autofocus because this is an autofocus camera. So if your camera is configured with autofocus, you'll get a little button here. So if I hit it, it's actually going to go through and check to see what the best focus on this is. Now the truth is, it was already at a pretty good focus, but just in case someone had messed it up. Now you might say, well, Bonnie, what is this green little strip doing here? Well, what it's doing is it's doing an image sharpness tool. It's basically saying, how sharp am I going from light to dark, dark to light? Its number doesn't matter. Since you're doing the autofocusing, it becomes a non-issue. But if you had a C-mount lens, what you would see is as you start doing the focus, you'll see it go to the right until at one point it stops going to the right and it comes back down. Okay. So basically, if your eyes can't see that it's focused very well, you can at least look for that bar that when it hits most to the right and then starts coming back again, then that's when you've reached your focusing sweet spot. Now, I still think it's kind of dark here. You guys can't see that much. So I'm just going to come back out of live mode. And what I want to do is, first thing I want to do is I'm going to turn on this show image saturation. It looks like a couple of mountains with a little sunset all with a red sky. This is also found underneath image, show image saturation as well. And if you're a key person, it control shift D. So I'm going to say show image saturation. Now, I can remove my overlay. I could tell you guys to remove overlays, because if you want to see the image, I can, right here where it looks like the little grid, I'm going to remove that. And you can see that it's showing me little blue dots here. Basically, if it's blue, it's telling me I am underexposed here. If I was looking for some type of, of item in this area, I probably wouldn't find them. They're letting me know it's just really dark here. But these are actually holes. I should be seeing these holes, so I'm not worried about it. Now, let's see if I can go brighter. So what I'm going to do is let me return back on my overlay. Now, be careful here. Right next to your overlay is graphics. Oh, that actually doesn't turn off those graphics. Interesting. But be careful. Don't turn off your graphics, because later when you start using your tools, you're going to say, ah, I'm not seeing results, and I'm going to say your graphics is off. OK, so let's go into A0. So I'm going to go into A0 right here. I'm just going to turn this off so I can see what's going on. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to increase my exposure. And every time I increase my exposure, you can see that it's starting to get a little brighter and brighter. Oh. Until such time, you see the red start coming in. Okay. Now, 26 milliseconds is kind of ridiculous to have that as an exposure setting. Okay. Any movement in here is going to look like it's blurred. But at least for me to try to control since I'm using the autofocus, I can ex control through exposure. And what the red is saying is, you've got too much light over here. Okay? So if I start having edges and everything over here, I might end up having some issues with them. They might be blue. They might get blurred out or something. Now, if I have a little bit of red, that's fine. 
But if I have a whole bunch of red, that's when I start having some issues because we just want a good amount in there. Now, I can also turn on my light. Let's see what happens if I turn on my light control. So if I go in here right now, it's disabled. If I say always, well, let's just say exposure controlled. Now, just at a light intensity of 1, I'm already really bright up here. Okay. So let me put this back to 8, see if that helps. So, dark. so I've got my light intensity. So what I could do is I'm just increasing my light intensity right now. Now, if you're using a 5,000, increasing that light intensity does nothing. But if you have a 7,000, it allows for you to go from 0 to 2, um, actually 0 to 100. Okay. So if I were to type in a 100 here, that would be as bright as those, those LEDs flash. Okay. I probably want to put it to something like maybe 10. And so I've got a pretty good image. I'm not seeing a ton of reflection off of it. I probably could get away with maybe a 20 here. Eh, it's starting to glare just a little bit. So having a little bit of red up here and a little bit of blue down here, that works for me. Because I'm not doing any edge analysis right here, so I'm not worried that, that I'm getting the glare right off of, of the center of this. That's fine. I would want to make sure that I'm not having my glare in here because that's where I'm going to do some 2D barcode reading. Don't want that. So everything looks pretty good. It's fairly bright. I'm going to go ahead and say OK. So now even if I go, notice that when I go live, it's still firing. My, my um, flash is still firing, my light. And so now if I go ahead and autofocus again, it'll be autofocusing with this new lighting set in. Should be about the same, but just in case. I actually gave it a little bit better. And beautiful. Got a nice, nice image there. Okay. So let's go out of live mode. Let me just take off this red and blue stuff. And beautiful. Got a nice image to use. And I'm ready to rock on with the application. Now let me show you guys one more thing, and this is that building formulas and everything like this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a 2 sitting at A2. I'm going to accept that. And I'm putting a 3 sitting at A3. So all that I've done is I put static numbers in here. If I acquire something on the camera, it does not change those numbers. They are statically stuck that way. Beautiful. So now what I want to do is I want to add these two numbers together. So the first thing I'm going to do is an absolute reference of adding those numbers together. So I'm going to go ahead and do it at A5. It's because it's an empty cell. Okay, I'm going to go into it. Now, I can either leave it sitting on this cell, which shoots it across my whole spreadsheet, or if I go up to the formula bar, it just reduces it to be one cell. It, it really depends on if you need to get to the cells next to it. If you don't, who cares? If you do, then you need to go up to the formula bar. So in any case, I said I was going to do this absolute. So if I'm going to do this absolute, I'm going to go to my absolute reference right here. And it puts me in this cell selection mode. So it says, what cell do you want to choose for an absolute reference? Or I'm going to choose A2, and I'm going to accept it. So as soon as I say A2, notice that A2 is put up here in my formula bar. We can see the little square around it. And now I can go up to the formula bar and put a plus in there. So now if I do absolute reference again, this time I'm going to choose A3, and I'm going to accept. So right now I have A2 plus A3. So as soon as I accept this, what's going to be sitting at A5? 5. Okay. Now notice if I go into A2 and I change this to maybe be something like 8, notice that A5 automatically updates dynamically to what those two static numbers change to. Beautiful. Love it. Now I'm going to do the same thing again, but I'm going to do relative referencing. So I'm going to go down to A7, go into an empty cell, double click on it. Once again, I can choose up here, doesn't matter. So now I'm going to do relative referencing. So I choose just the grid. First I choose A2, accept that, give it a little plus. Then I choose A3, say accept. So what's going to be sitting at A7 when I say OK? going to be those two numbers added together. In fact, if I go in here and I change this to maybe be a negative 1, then sure enough, both of those other formulas dynamically change for this. So you might say, well, what's the difference between them? Aha, 
I'm glad you asked. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to A5. <laughs> I'm going to go right click and say copy. And I'm going to maybe move it over to D5. Right click, paste. Control V, Control C, and Control V work too, by the way. Um, so beautiful. Still looks at it. In fact, it says A2 plus A3 and still seeing a 7 there. Beautiful. Now I'm going to do the same thing here. I'm going to do right click, copy, bring it over to here, paste. Uh oh, what happened here? It's relative. So what it's looking for now is D2 plus D3 because I moved from A to D. So it moves all the columns over three columns and says, what's sitting there? Well, there's nothing sitting there. So of course, I get a zero there. Now you might say, well, Bonnie, is there an easier way to do it? Of course there's an easier way to do it. There's always easier ways to do things. Okay. So let me do the same thing again. So I'm going to go into an empty cell. And now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to choose A2. Now, do you see what my cursor is showing right now? Ignore the click to insert. But Notice the bottom right-hand corner of my cursor. What does it look like? It looks like a grid, and the grid was what? Absolute or relative? It's relative, exactly. So if I just do click plus click, that's the same thing, but relative. I don't have to go up and say relative. It by default does relative. Now I might go in there and say, oh, but wait a minute. I wanted A2 to be absolute reference. So how could I change it to be an absolute reference? So do you, do you guys know you uh, Excel masters? How do you change from relative and absolute or back again in Excel? You could type it in, but Excel does the same thing. Whether I'm right on the left of it, in the middle of it, or right to the side of it, as long as I'm touching that cell, if I hit F4, changes it to all absolute. If I hit F4 again, it's absolute only row, not column. If I hit it again, it's absolute only column, not row. And if I hit it again, it's relative all. So it will cycle me through all four combinations of relative and absolute. I prefer not to type when at all possible, because typing means I'm introducing human error into my program. So like I said, this was just to kind of show you what's going on. I'm going to end up not using it. I'm just grabbing it and just saying delete okay, to get rid of it. All that I'm going to do is I'm just going to change my image to being continuous so that if I go online and say, do you want to go online? Yep. And then it's off and running. So right now I want you guys to all get a good image.